God, what a joy. This is really wonderful. Thank you all so much for coming. Before we start, uh, I really want to thank our sponsors. You know, the work that we do at CCARE, and for those of you who may not know CCARE, which stands for the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, is a center here based at Stanford in the Neuroscience Institute as part of the School of Medicine. And our agenda is not only to do fundamental science related to, uh, if you will, the value proposition of being compassionate, and also to recognize that that is our default mode as human beings, uh, <clears throat> but also to uh, uh, promote this research and disseminate it to a larger audience. And it's not just what we do, it's what is being done in labs all over the world now. And really, I believe that we're at the, uh, really, the start of a movement. And, and this is the movement to change the paradigm of how we function in society and understand that without integrating these, this core value into our actions as human beings, our species is not going to survive. And the extraordinary thing is that Obviously, over the last several decades, we have seen how technology is profoundly having an impact on all of our lives. And obviously, to be where we are today, we could not function without that technology, without that science. But the downside of that is that on some level, there's a cost. And that cost is that instead of having direct social connection, oftentimes it has resulted in people becoming more isolated, uh, more feeling alone, and obviously uh, the consequences thereof. I mean, imagine where one quarter of people in the West will tell you that they do not have a person that they feel comfortable with when they're <clears throat> to share their pain or suffering. One quarter of people. How is that even possible? Especially in, in our society where we have essentially everything that science and technology can give, but on the other hand, in some level, we have nothing. And in fact, if you look at some of these primitive cultures, which oftentimes have been denigrated, these oftentimes have the deepest wisdom traditions, the greatest insights, and fundamentally understand that connection, compassion are at our essence, and that is what allows us to thrive as human beings. Understanding at the same time, though, that the technologies that have been developed and are being developed are critical to uh, decrease human suffering, to uh, spread resources, education, uh, and health, hopefully, to uh, those who do not have that at this time it is not going to go away, and in fact, it's going to be more prevalent. But the key is understanding the downside, but also, and the point of this conference is, how can we take what we know is the value proposition in terms of compassionate behavior, how it impacts us as human beings, how it results in us living better, being healthier, increasing our longevity, and you use these insights that we have gathered from technology to actually promote connection, decrease isolation, and really bring the true value proposition of technology to man. You know, I gave a talk <clears throat> at my medical school uh, to the new medical students a while back. And I think, though, the same statement is analogous uh, today. Science and technology is wonderful, but science and technology <clears throat> is not going to hold a child who is suffering. It's not going to hold the hand of someone who's dying. That is a human quality that is never going to be replaced by technology. But how do we use technology to bring that connection together? to make you feel connected in an authentic way and ultimately
through that, save our species. So that's what our goal is today. It's a humble goal, I recognize. <laughs> so uh, what we're doing today is, as obviously all of you know, is first of all, we're going to start out with the science aspect of this and looking into, uh, if you will, some of the science behind uh, why it pays to be compassionate. And then the other part of the uh, morning talks, the second panel discussion, is actually about sort of the technology engineering side of it and some of the uh, aspects of that that are important to this conversation. Then the really exciting part happens on the second half, which is we have had uh, a contest, if you will, to create an app. We have a series of uh, judges. We've had great responses from all over the world, really some incredible, thoughtful uh, uh, approaches to some aspects of this. And we're going to uh, see the top 10 finalists, the 10 semi-finalists. But I will tell you, none of these were bad. They were all actually quite interesting and extraordinary. And the task sometimes of being a judge is that it's like, what is Solomon splitting the baby? We split the baby in many pieces, and it, and it was, made me feel very guilty. But uh, so that is uh, where we're going to go today. So, you know, it's interesting because people talk about compassion in different ways. And the way we use it, and I think the way most of you use it, is that this is the recognition that everyone is suffering. And an authentic desire to alleviate that suffering. And by doing so, not only allow yourself, but allow each individual to reach their greatest potential. And, you know, if you look at Maslow's triangle, you know, everyone in this room, we're blessed because I hope everyone in this room, we have overcome that lowest part of the triangle, which is security, safety, food, and then we've gone to the second part. But the thing that allows for transcendence and that allows us to define our purpose in this world, which is really uh, what each of us ultimately wants, is a self-actualization of this transcendence, and which I submit to you can only occur when you embrace others as yourself. That is the ultimate manifestation of compassion, because every person you intersect with is fundamentally your caring for yourself. That is our goal, that is our challenge. So without further ado, I would like to bring our panelists up. Our first panelist is my dear Emma Sapala. And Emma, for those of you who don't know, who is the person who actually does all the damn work, okay? <laughs> Yes, so give, give her a big hand. <laughs> Emma is really the force. I have been blessed to have someone who is not only brilliant, dedicated, completely passionate about this topic, and really her and our other team. Where are our other CCARE team members here? Stand up. OK, well, we only have one, apparently. No. Uh, I'm a slave driver, so they're all out there working, and they're too busy to even talk to anybody. But uh, without individuals who work with us, volunteer with us, support our work, really, we could not do any of the work. I, and while I may be the front person for this, and people look to me sometimes, it's really not me. It is a team of people of which, frankly, I'm the smallest part. These people are really the nuts and the bolts and the gears of making this manifest itself. So uh, our panelists are Emma, who uh, has an extraordinary background. She got her PhD here at Stanford in uh, uh, loving kindness meditation, as I recall. Uh, she has multiple degrees. She speaks five languages. She is one of these irritatingly brilliant people who just can do anything. And I have to overcome that with compassion, my jealousy. <laughs> Uh, the other part of our panis, panelists are, and, and, and uh, Emma's going to speak about the science of compassion. Our next panelist is Monica Warlin. She is a brilliant scientist 
and she's going to talk about uh, the importance of compassion for business. And she participated in our conference several months ago with the Business School on Business and Compassion, which, how many of you attended that? Any? All right. It was a good conference. Thank you. Sarah Conrath uh, from University of Michigan. Dr. Conrath is at the Institute for Social Research with affiliations in social psychology and psychiatry. She's going to be talking about using text messages to increase empathy. And then, uh, unfortunately, Constance Steinkuhler uh, is ill and could not be with us, and she's being replaced by Mark Brackett from Yale, which is also Emma's alma mater. And uh, <clears throat> he is a research scientist in the Department of Psychology and the Deputy Director of Yale's Health, Emotion, and Behavior Laboratory and head of the Emotional Intelligence Unit. And he's going to talk about uh, some of his work. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Porges, who is a world-renowned pioneer in the Vagal Pathways, and uh, he's going to talk about, if you will, the portals to compassion and the uh, importance of the parasympathetic nervous system in this regard. So it's really going to be quite exciting. I'm looking forward to it. And without further ado, we shall begin. Emma, thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the science behind compassion. And, you know, when we think of compassion, we think of it as this very nice notion, um, something we should all aspire to. But what the science is actually showing us is that it is um, fundamental for our health and well-being. So one study showed that our mind wanders about 50% of the time. So during the conference, you might be capturing about 50%. We hope more. But where, do us, our, where does our mind wander when it's wandering? Well, for, for many, uh, in many instances, it wanders towards the obvious. <laughs> um, sex, as well as other addictive substances, uh, perhaps cigarettes or whatever, um, whatever the choice of substance. Um, but there's a place where our mind wanders more. There's an urge that's even stronger than that. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> a study that came out this year showed that uh, we have stronger urges, more thoughts of wanting to check our email and check our Facebook notifications than sex or um, other kinds of um, urges. Very interesting to think about, why could this be? Why is this the case? Well, one thing we know is that social connection is one of the most fundamental desires that we have and needs that we have. In fact, um, quoting Dan Gilbert, a psychologist at Harvard, is that the best predictor of human happiness is human relationships and the amount of time that people spend with family and friends. It's absolutely integral to our well-being. And um, in fact, it has enormous repercussions on psychological health, immunity, longevity, um, and, and also our psychological happiness and well-being. So um, we recently uh, conducted a survey with 600 people just asking them, what is it in your life that brings you the greatest sense of fulfillment? And a number of answers were given, but by far the greatest majority of um, answers were, had to do with social connection and helping others. So that sense of being connected to other people. We asked the question in a slightly different way, what would you do if you had three days to live? And then again, overwhelmingly, it was spending time with loved ones. So social connection is something that we actually know um, that how much we need it and, and on a fundamental level, even though you know, the world can tell you, you know, oh, buy this fancy car, or I need to achieve this success or that. But on a fundamental level, we know that social connection is the most important thing beyond our basic survival needs. Um, and that's also what science is showing in terms of our health. So um, when, what do we see when there's low social connection? When a sense of isolation, we actually see increased inflammation at the cellular level. We see increased anxiety, depression, instances of violence. So vi perpetrators of violence that we hear about are often people who are severely isolated. Similarly, a low social connection has been linked to suicide. So it's really a dramatic, uh, it has dramatic repercussions. And as Dr. Doty just mentioned, one out of four people does not feel like they have anyone to share a personal problem with in the US. And this was the results of a national survey. So it's just an interesting thought to think about, even as we go about our day, thinking about um, one, of, one out of four people is someone that feels isolated. So it's, there's always an opportunity to reach out, because we never know who we will be touching. Great. So why is it, and so 
And one thing that we may or may not be aware of is that we are completely wired to connect with others. In fact, we're wired for empathy. And some people, thank you. Some people think uh, that you know, empathy is something that needs to be trained. I have to you know, take a training to be more empathic. But actually, you're wired to be empathic. Think about it. When you walk down the street and you see someone trip and fall, you immediately flinch, right? Because we internally mirror other people. So when we, if someone walks in that we know very well, they don't need to say anything. Within seconds, we know whether they're, uh, something's terribly wrong or wonderfully right. Because our brain has uh, the capacity, um, we have mirror neurons which help us uh, reflect what's going on in someone else internally so we know what they're experiencing. And this is just an automatic natural process, which is why maybe you, know, you see someone in tears and all of a sudden you can be moved, or vice versa if they're laughing. So we are wired for empathy um, very automatically. And um, for example, actually when, when um, during brain imaging, um, for your own pain, so you're in a brain scanner and you're getting some pain inflicted, um, the same, similar brain regions are activated when you see pain inflicted on someone else. So we can think of ourselves as these isolated human beings, but actually we are so connected, whether we know it or not, in every moment, in every interaction. And we're also actually um, uh, wired for compassion. And again, this is, you know, there's this myth out there that you know, everybody's walking around with a lot of self-interest. Well, that may be the case, but what's really innate to us is the tendency for compassion, the tendency for fairness. Um, and we see that both in, in infants too young to have learned the rules of politeness, they will automatically help when uh, the situation arises. And this has been shown in multiple experiments. Um, and the same with primates. Um, so and even in the animal kingdom, even in an animal as lowly as a rat, um, perhaps an animal that many of us don't respect. I do, I respect them, but you know, it's not something that we think about a lot. Um, but rats uh, will go out of their way to help Another rat that's suffering, they will pay a price to help them. That's why I respect them, and I think they're worthy of respect. Um, but just to show that that desire to help someone else who's suffering is just very innate to us. And sometimes one may wonder, oh, what about in adults? It doesn't always seem to be the case. Well, actually, if you give adults only a few seconds to make a decision about whether or not they will act fairly, they will act fairly. If you give them a little longer to think about it, you know, then they're like, well, wait a second. <laughs> you know, they, there's, for a number of reasons, they may or may not act it, but that is our first um, tendency. And in fact, it's ensured our survival. So um, Rob, uh, Robert Sapolsky, who's a, a wonderful stress uh, researcher here at the medical school, has shown in research with baboons in Africa that, you know, who is it that reproduces more? It's actually the baboons that are the most pro-social. Um, and the same tr is true in, in perhaps in humans. Well, actually, according to um, some research on dating preferences, men and women actually look for different qualities in a partner. But what is the quality that they rate as highest? Kindness, always. So perhaps it ensures our survival and reproduction as well. Um, and one of the uh, most interesting findings about compassion is that it's very much linked to longevity. Um, and in one study with volunteers, the vol uh, people who had volunteers lived longer, but only if they did so from an altruistic intent. So that seems to be a, a crucial element here. I'm just going to a quote by Charles Darwin. We often think of Charles Darwin as having said survival of the fittest. He didn't. That was actually Herbert Benson who wanted to justify social hierarchies. Um, Charles Darwin's message was more akin to uh, something slightly different. Sympathy will have been increased through natural selection. For those communities which included the greatest number of the most sympathetic members would flourish best and rear the greatest number of offspring. So, um, and one, one reason why um, compassion may be you know, an evolutionary adapted trait um, and, and is that it makes us incredibly happy. Um, it has been linked to, um, to well-being, but also even in, in brain imaging studies, seeing, seeing money go to charity um, in, increases activation in brain regions uh, responsible for, for happiness and well-being to the same extent as seeing money go into your own bank accounts. So it has, there's... Um, there's really a link there that oftentimes people don't realize between our own well-being and compassion. And finally, this is something that you can look to your own experience for, but research has been done on this as well, is that what happens when you see someone helping someone else? 
So just think about a moment. You're walking down the street, or you saw someone helping another person, an elderly person, a child, and you were moved. How many people have had this experience? So they, they're moved seeing that. So it's a common experience that we have, and it's been coined elevation. It's really that sense of being moved when you see an act of beauty, of kindness. And um, what happens when we experience elevation? We're more likely to go out and help others. So there's kind of a chain reaction that happens. So we often think, oh, well, I'm this one person. What difference can I make in the world? Well, research by um, Nicholas Christakis has shown that one act of kindness has a huge repercussion for uh, to, uh, up to three layers of separation away. So if you do an act of kindness, someone who, you know, your friend's sister's neighbor will also be more likely to do an act of kindness, if that makes sense. And you can think about it in terms of that um, inspiration you feel in, and when you're feeling that elevation, how it inspire, it makes you feel good, it helps the person you're helping, it inspires those around you, and it continues in a chain effect. So I will uh, leave you with that thought and um, hope you enjoy the day today. I would like to build on what Emma told you about the science of compassion among human individuals and talk about what organizational and sociological research tells us about how compassion unfolds and becomes a strategic concern for businesses and human service organizations. But first, I would like to give you a gift. Two minutes of my time. When you know my time, you'll understand this is a significant gift. <laughs> to ground yourselves in what we're talking about today. So please meet someone sitting next to you, and very briefly, one of you share a story about an experience of compassion at work, or a time when you needed compassion but didn't receive it. And I will interrupt you when your time is up. Thank your partner, please. <clears throat> I'm sorry to interrupt your story. I'd like to hear many of the stories that you shared, but since our format today doesn't allow that kind of workshop learning, let me use a compassion story to unfold for you compassion as a social process which builds on the psychological process that Emma was talking with you about. Somewhere in your story, there was a person experiencing some kind of distress in an organizational context. Let's imagine, for the sake of imagination, that that distress is that we've made a mistake in our work and we're worried about the repercussions. There is a decision about whether or not to express that distress in the organizational environment and what we know from research is that that decision depends on things like the organization's emotion display rules, norms for behavior, and shared values. Whether or not the person chooses to express their distress or their pain in the organization, there's also a chance that other people in the context will notice or not notice that distress. And noticing pain in organizational contexts actually becomes quite complex. Because if I notice a colleague in distress, I may have to do quite a bit of work to understand what that distress is about, which is what I mean in the diagram by sense making. While simultaneously, the person in distress is also attempting to make sense of the fact of whether other people in the organization are noticing suffering or not. And this noticing can be affected by status level in the organization, by the role demands that we're under, and by simply how busy we are and the attentional load that we're carrying. Imagine 
I've picked up on the fact that I have a colleague in distress, and now I feel instantaneous empathic concern, as Emma told us, but I'm trying to make sense of whether or not it's okay to feel that in this environment. So I may talk to other people about what I'm experiencing in an attempt to understand it, which may in turn activate their empathic concern, or it may, if we don't want to be anywhere associated with this mistake that happened in the organization, actually send us in the other direction. And we may experience aversion rather than empathic concern. When we feel empathy and make sense of it in the organization in ways that enable us to act on it, what we do together to respond to our colleagues' distress is likely to depend on what we believe is appropriate in our organizational context. Research shows us that it really matters the messages that we receive from leaders, but it also matters what we already know how to do and what is routinized and practiced already in our organization and whether we can take advantage of those routines to make coordinated compassion easier. If we manage to get through this incredibly complex social process to the actual expression of compassion in an organizational environment, what we know from our research is that whether you are the recipient of that compassion, whether you simply witness it going on around you but don't participate, or whether you're the giver of the compassion, it changes the meaning of yourself at work and the self that you can be in the environment. <clears throat> it changes the meaning that you ascribe to the organization you work in. It changes the relationship that you have with the people around you that you work with. And it unlocks all kinds of resources, some of which can be directed back to that person that we originally started with who was in distress. So now that I've given you an incredibly condensed overview of a large body of research, <laughs> I want to give you five, my top five list about why you should begin to think if you manage an organization, if you lead a team, if you are an entrepreneur hoping to found an organization, you should think of compassion as innately related to your competitive advantage and your capacity to do things that make your organization stand out in your industry. Number five, you have to acquire and keep highly talented people. And in order to do that, they want to work in a place where they feel that they belong and they feel that they can contribute. There's a growing body of research that says that the experience of compassion at work increases attachment to the organization, increases commitment, and decreases intention to leave. Number four, you may have read recently the latest Gallup research about disengagement in organizations that suggests that up to 70% of people who show up at work every day are not mentally or physically engaged in what they're doing. With incredible cost to organizations, you can increase discretionary effort, increase organizational citizenship, and increase engagement through the experience of compassion in your organization. Number three, you need to undertake incredibly complex interdependent tasks and have them done well. What we know about the experience of compassion in an organization, again, whether you witness it, whether you receive it, or whether you give it, is that it changes people's willingness and competence in working together on complex tasks. We know this whether we look at gate agents and flight teams who are trying to get planes off on time, or whether we look at surgical teams doing highly complex manipulations of human bodies in a safe way. The experience of compassion in your work fundamentally changes your capacity to do complex interdependent tasks collaboratively. Number two, if you run a service organization or if your technology organization depends on customer service as a distinctive advantage, which almost all do, you should know that the experience of compassion in work changes service quality through two mechanisms that are documented in research. First, as you might expect, people who have more practice of compassion in their workplace have more capacity to handle suffering, complaints, or difficulties expressed by customers. An alternative route, which may be more surprising to people, 
is that people who experience more compassion among their coworkers actually have more discretionary emotional resources to spend giving high quality service. So a recent study showed that the experience of compassion among colleagues in, an, in a hospital setting, controlling for almost everything else you could possibly control for that affects patient satisfaction, has an independent effect on patient satisfaction scores as measured by standardized Medicare data. And finally, for this room, the number one reason that you want to care about compassion as a strategic concern is that it has an impact directly on psychological safety, which is the number one mechanism that helps people experiment more, learn from mistakes better, and get themselves into position to make the next big breakthrough that will drive disruptive technology and take your organization to the next level. So there you have it, the top five evidence-based reasons from social and organizational research that you should think of compassion not only as a humanistic concern, but also as a very key strategic concern for your organization. Thank you. Okay, so now I don't have to convince you that it's important to try to build compassion and empathy, um, thankfully, because that's a long talk. Um, and I'm just going to tell you about an effort in our lab to try to do this using technology. And this arises from work that we've had finding that empathy in, among college students, at least the dispositional trait empathy, uh, they're reporting lower levels of it in recent years. Um, so we're trying to understand why and whether there's anything we can do about it. So the definition of empathy is a 10-minute segment in itself, but I'm just going to tell you that I think of it very broadly and maybe in a similar broad sense of compassion, but I, I, I see different ways of measuring it and then different ways, of, uh, different aspects to it. So one aspect is a more cognitive aspect, which is we call perspective taking and often involves the, more of an ability or skill to imagine other people's points of views and perspectives and how their life um, circumstances might affect the way they're thinking. Um, Another is emotional empathy, which uh, can include empathic concern, um, which is this direct emotional resonance when someone is suffering, or I think we can also fairly say that might be compassion, the feeling of it, um, and the desire to help, so this motivational element that when you see somebody who's suffering, you want to do something about it rather than just see it. And then all of those feed into research finds that feed into behaviors. So people who are in a state where they're in a cognitive empathy state or a more emotional empathy state are more likely to actually do something and help when someone needs something. So my general definition is a positive and responsive orientation of the self toward others versus a more egotism, which is more about a self-focus at the expense of others. So I think a lot of people might think empathy is a trait that you're born with, and some people are more empathetic and others are, are less, and that's just the way it is, and there's nothing you can do. But that's not actually reflective of real research. Um, so I actually think of it as more of a muscle, I think a metaphor of a muscle. It doesn't go all the way, that metaphor, but it starts. <laughs> um, but the, way, the reason I think of that is, like anyone who's not naturally athletic, here, right here, um, <laughs> Exercising, if it's not your natural thing, takes a lot of work at the beginning, but if you keep doing it and you just plug away, it becomes habitual and easier and actually pleasurable eventually. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I agree that empathy is, and compassion are our natural states, but I think our modern world actually does a lot to inhibit those natural states, and so sometimes we need little booster shots to build our empathy, which we're trying to do in our lab. So there's evidence that it's a strongly heritable trait. So there, is, there are some real individual differences, and there is some natural, I guess, athletic ability and empathy. And there's also stability. So people who are more empathetic at one time point are also um, more empathetic at another time point. Um, they tend to be empathetic across different situations. Um, and it's stable, the trait at least is stable throughout the adult lifespan. So there's some evidence that maybe there is stability, but I don't think stability is the only answer. Um, the fact that people are really responsive when they do see that person trip means that there is this ability to activate. It can be res uh, responsive to situations. 
Um, and it's also affected by motivation. So there's research showing that it can be trained if you incentivize it, believe it or not. Um, you could actually say, hey, I'll give you points or a prize for recognizing more emotions, and people can do that. And our work on, find, on changes in empathy in college students show that there's probably some environmental component that can affect um, empathy levels. And finally, there's a whole lot of work already. Um, I have 150 articles right now that I have to go through um, showing that it is teachable, that, that you can teach aspects of empathy um, using programs. And here's some of them. You can train people to be better at emotion recognition. Um, you can highlight similarity between themselves and others and make that a, a habitual practice. Um, you can just simply role play other people's feelings, in which um, your exercise was really helpful for. Thank you. <laughs> and um, you can, if you know somebody who's really empathic, you can kind of channel that person. And I think we're all doing that with Nelson Mandela um, right now uh, and because of recent events. So we're wondering if we can use a new teaching method, embracing this technology, although it might be part of the root of our lower empathy. Um, and most of the studies so far on building empathy have been about uh, using a classroom setting in a, or in a lab. And so it's very controlled and it has, it's only affecting a certain group of people, which of course can have this effect that these people then go out and become more compassionate. But I'm interested in trying to disseminate it more widely than that. Um, so there are some, a couple of studies I've found showing that you can actually train people to be empathic using videos, and I think that's really promising. But I'm interested in trying to do it in more of an everyday life, and I just want to see a show of hands. If you have a cell phone, can you put up your hand? <laughs> wow, that was a good survey. <laughs> I like it. Okay, if your cell phone is um, somewhere in the room with you today, put up your hand. If you could reach it right now, if it was reachable. Okay, is it turned off? <laughs> so yes, that was a trick question. <laughs> the point is, we have, we have an available method to reach everybody, and we're trying to use that method in our lab. So um, I want to give credit where it's due. This is not something I came up with. This is something that public health researchers have been doing for quite a bit of time. The earliest study I could find was from 2003, so they've been on this before I even knew how to text. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, you can see there's been lots of research in public health. This is just a, a little bit of a smattering of what they're doing, but there's many meta-analyses. It's at the state of the field right now that's very advanced. Um, and they're trying to help people quit smoking and have better sexual health, and there's many, many different types of interventions that are available and promising, um, and even sort of rules about how to make them better and so on. And this is great because you can reach populations you know, outside of the United States and developing countries they're often working with. Because um, even in developing countries, if I ask the same question about who owns a cell phone, a lot of people would be raising their hands. And yes, we understand that, um, <laughs> that this, this is a very odd method, maybe, to teach empathy in particular. But there's something, uh, I think, pragmatic better. We do think it's probably better to teach it face-to-face -face because it is a natural practice type of thing. And in the messages that we've designed, we've tried to make it so that people look at the message and then it's part of their next interaction, that they're going to actually practice it with the next person they're talking to, or they're imagining the last person they talk to. Um, I do think it would be great to test, to compare face-to-face -face versus text message, and I think face-to-face -face would definitely win. Um, but pragmatically, these technologies aren't going anywhere. They're all over the place, and we need to do something. And that's why this conference is so important. So our research question is very simple. Can we use text messages to build empathy? And this is work that's sponsored by the Templeton Foundation. And our rationale is let's give people f uh, frequent daily bursts of empathy training to see if we can make uh, empathy sort of habitual, so that they don't even think about it anymore, even if it was effortful at the beginning for some people, for whatever reason, that it becomes something that's just at the back of their mind. So here's the procedure. We had people come into our lab um, for an hour. And we measured empathy in a very complicated way, but it covers all of those different aspects. We use multiple measures, and I think that's important in order to understand exactly which aspects of empathy are being affected. And then they're randomly assigned to receive some text messages. And I think whoever's handing out those papers right now, that would be, I don't know. I do have some examples of the text messages. Um, and yeah. they'll hand out, and maybe you should have them at your table. Just anyway, each table will get a couple of uh, papers to look at some of the examples, because I can't go in them for time in this uh, presentation. But they're randomized to an empathy condition or a self 
or objective control condition. And what I mean by objective is, I mean, it's obvious that self-focus would be part of a control, but objective um, is like taking a sort of a sense of distance from people's emotions, which I think is also kind of an opposite or low empathy approach. Um, and we just didn't have the ability to separate those two conditions. Um, and then we also have a, a condition where people got no treatment. They just responded to questions via text message. Okay, they are already passed out. Sorry. Oh, they are passed out. Okay, good. Sorry, I didn't know that. They should have them on your table. Great. So if you, you might have them on your table. You can look at the messages if you want. But here's what we did. For 14 days, participants received messages. They received six um, empathy building or self-focus building messages a day, which seems like a lot, and it was. I was a, a pilot subject, it, but it does the trick, I think. Um, and then everyone responds to questions about like how they're feeling and how connected they are. And then we bring them back into our lab and we assess a lot of the similar measures as we did in the first point, and then um, including a behavioral option of helping. So here are our measures. You can see it does cover those those different um, aspects, and I'm. In the interest of time, I'm just going to move forward quickly to just show you what we found generally. Um, and here's our analysis. We just run the, um, we look at the effect of our treatment on the um, outcome in the post-intervention, controlling for their baseline score. So this is change in participants over time. And what we find is that there is actually no effect on helping. So people are no more likely to help if they've been given the empathy intervention. Um, but the people who uh, do choose to help, they're giving more time uh, if they're in the empathy group. And uh, let's see what else. We, we looked at aggression, because in our lab we're also interested in sort of the opposites of empathy or the lower empathy behaviors. And we found that people, men in particular, were less likely to agree that aggression was um, an okay strategy to use after they had been trained in the empathy program. And here's the example. You can see that we made men look like women there. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe they wouldn't like that. But um, so, so we find that it increases um, pro-social behavior motivation and de decreases uh, aggressive beliefs. But I'm still not ready to conclude that we've increased empathy because there's obviously problems right now. And um, these, are message, these are methods that people often use, but I think they're subject to experimental des demand. So obviously people can come into our lab and go, oh yeah, I'm gonna be more empathetic because they want us to. So let me breeze through the rest. Um, even observers rated these people as more empathetic, just research assistants who'd interacted with them just for a brief um, amount of time. Um, and I'm gonna move forward here and show you that when it came to the trade empathy though, there was no effect on people's perceptions of their perspective taking skills. And there was an effect on empathic concern, but it was in the opposite direction. So people who had received the empathy training actually believed that they weren't empathetic or they were less empathetic by the end of it, which I think is very interesting. Could be explained by perhaps a contrast effect. They suddenly see this very high standard of what it means to be empathic, and they're like, that's not me. And yet they're behaving in a way that observers are rating as empathic. It could be because we're giving them these instructions and they feel like they're behaving empathetically because we told them to. We don't know. The important part of the study is that we, also, we realize that when they're in the lab, they're on their best behavior and they know we're running a study. Uh, we called it social skills training, but by the end of the study, I'm sure they knew what we were doing. So we followed them up about six months later and um, they didn't really know we were doing this. They, we sent them a message on their cell phones that said, stop texting me, you jerk. And it was from an, a number that was not, you could Google it, but there was nothing there. <laughs> and we wanted to see what they would do. So this is a real test. This is not in our research lab. And uh, they didn't know it was us. Um, and yes, the IRB let us do this. <laughs> so here are some responses that we code as low empathy. Never. <laughs> or, um, I don't even read it. I can't read it. I feel like it's uh, within my right to continue, and there are some responses I can't put here. <laughs> and then the higher empathy examples, which this one's so sweet. I'm sorry you're having a bad day, but I think you have the wrong number. Can you imagine saying that? Gulp. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. So, and then, sorry, who is this? So we coded if they said sorry, we thought that was pretty nice. And I'm a Canadian, and I say it a lot, so anyway. <laughs> All right, so what we find is that, of course, uh, the empathy people who are, they, they did respond in an objectively more pro-social manner. This is coded by two people. The intercoder reliability is really high. So I think I'm more confident now that we're doing something good with this, but 
open to feedback. So here's your summary results. And I'm already out of time, and so I appreciate your empathy as, <laughs> as I've gone over. And our future directions, we'd like to know um, implications. I think what Emma was saying in terms of mental health and physical health. And um, also variations on the intervention, just to have a better understanding of how it works and what is exactly needed to make it effective. And that's it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm just thinking that how many of you believe that by the 15th presentation, your empathy and compassion is going to be lower? <laughs> and um, I, I say that only because the, the work that we do, obviously, is on emotional intelligence and is looking at the role of emotions in our attentional capacities, in our decision-making, judgments, relationships, and even mental and physical health. So uh, as a fill-in today, um, I was up around 11.45 last night. I said, what am I going to talk about? And uh, so I decided to share with you uh, a tool that we've developed that we call the Mood Meter. And the reason why I decided to talk with you about that is because our collaborators from Hope Lab uh, are building our app for the Mood Meter. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of the science around this construct so that when they come up, you can see the manifestation in the app. The, uh, the center that I now direct is called the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. And essentially, uh, our goal is to use the power of emotional intelligence to make a better world. And uh, you can see that compassion is in our vision. Uh, but we're broader. We're interested in building a healthy society, people um, helping build effectiveness and, and compassion. And what we do in our center is both science and practice meaning that we have been studying for over 20 years now the role of emotions in all these aspects of life, developing tests of emotional intelligence, and now uh, for the last 10 years focused mostly on developing educational approaches. And uh, so we have a program we call RULER that is now in about 1,000 schools throughout the United States and abroad. And uh, what we're doing is scaling up that program to reach around another million children in the next three years. What is emotional intelligence? Um, how many of you have read a book or an article on emotional intelligence? OK, so I should just go home. Uh, my guess is that you've read uh, articles on emotional intelligence and books on emotional intelligence that have a variety of definitions. Uh, that, that think about the construct in, in a myriad ways, from being optimistic to being self-aware to being kind to having motivation to being, having grit and determination. And um, what we've done in our lab and center is really focused on the intersection of emotion and cognition and the skills that people need to live a more emotionally intelligent life. But they have to have emotion as their central focus. So the five skills that we've really focused on now are the perception of emotion or the recognition of emotion in self and others. Uh, the second is the understanding of the causes and consequences of emotion. So that gets at really how do our emotions influence our judgment and decision making. So when you are feeling yellow, which you'll see in a minute on the mood meter, when you're feeling optimistic and high energy, how does it affect the content of your cognition um, differently than when you're in the blue, when you're feeling down, disappointed, maybe even hopeless? Uh, the third is the labeling of emotion, the, which is obvious, uh, having those words. The fourth is the expression of emotion, the knowing the how and the when to express our emotions and with different people in different contexts. So we have a lot of cultures here, and the rules, as all of us know, are different in different cultures. And finally, the regulation of emotion. So let's get into this. I'm going to ask everyone to take a moment and please sit up straight in your seats. Good posture. We know that helps you be compassionate. I have no research to support it, but I'm just going <laughs> to say it anyway. Take a nice long inhale and a nice long exhale and just let it go. And ask yourself, how are you feeling? This is the tool that's going to help you do that. On the x-axis is your pleasantness. So right now, all of you have some degree of pleasantness. Minus five would mean that like, you're thinking to yourself, like, I got to get out of here. Like, really? One more talk on compassion? You've got to be kidding me. Plus five, you're thinking to yourself, I'm in a room with people that all are like-minded. Like, this is going to be a dream. This is, this is like, I've never in my life imagined this could happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At least one of us is there. 
um, some of you might be smack in the middle, sort of, I'm from New York, so it's sort of like, you know, how are you feeling? Like, eh, you know, whatever, get out of my way. So please give yourself a number on the x-axis. Y is your energy. Uh, the technical term in psychology is uh, arousal, but for our work in schools, we leave that out. Um, <laughs> So minus five is that you're sort of in the deepest pool of despair. You're, you've sapped. You have no energy left. You just can't. You're about to fall asleep. Plus five, you're so activated, you just can't keep yourself contained. Yeah. Yeah. There's some disorders for that, too, you know. <laughs> so please uh, give yourself a number on the y-axis. And now you're just going to put the two together. How many of you are in the yellow today, feeling high energy and pleasant? How many of you are in the green, feeling pleasant, but you're lower in energy? OK, you can see your hands are lower. <laughs> uh, blue and red, how many of you are feeling unpleasant, low in energy? And anybody in the red this morning? A little bit? Um, that's unpleasant with a lot of energy. Um, so be mindful of that. I have to have compassion for people who are in all states. Um, I'm going to ask you now to please close your eyes. And I'm going to give you three seconds to come up with a word that best describes how you're feeling. Open your eyes. Just an honest raise of hands. How many of you had some trouble finding the best word? Put your hands up really high. Up, like stretch. Look around the room. So a large proportion of us are having trouble just pinpointing the one word. Now, if I had more time, I'd ask you for your hypotheses about that, but I'm just going to tell you what I think. Um, um, and my, why, well, I'm going to ask one, a few people, why do you think it is so challenging? Why, why is it that we can say, oh, I'm in the yellow, but when I say, well, how are you feeling exactly, it's challenging? Because yellow. yellow is what? You're just, you're just so blown away, you just can't, what's that? Are you just okay? It's a possibility. Others? It's complicated. Thank you. Um, how many of you believe maybe you haven't been taught a sophisticated emotion vocabulary? Yay! The obvious. Uh, what our work shows is that people just don't have the language. You know, when they're in the yellow, they feel great. Green, fine. Blue, uh, red, pissed. Uh, but yet, there are over 2,000 words in the English Language Dictionary that help us to differentiate our emotions. And one of our hypotheses and things that we assert is that if you can name it, you can tame it. That when you are more granular about your emotional lives, what you can do is choose better strategies. So what I want to share with you now are how we use the tool. When we teach this tool to children and adults, what we do is we first teach them the facial expressions, the body postures, the vocal tones, and the physiology associated with each of these quadrants. So what does it look like to be in the yellow, green, blue, and red? What does it feel like in your body? And that goes according to the different words that are there. The second thing we do is teach people about the causes and the consequences. So what brings you to the red? Because we know that emotions are not about the events. They're about the appraisals. Right, the things that bring me to the red have a theme of injustice, but what makes me uh, perceive an injustice and what makes you perceive an injustice may be a very different thing. And importantly, know the consequences of emotion in terms of how they influence our thinking, our judgments, uh, our behavior. So for example, we've done studies with teachers. We randomly assign them to be in a green mood or a yellow mood or a blue mood or a red mood, and then we have them grade their students' papers. And uh, I don't know if you want to use the word compassion for this, but there are significant differences in the way they grade their students. Uh, one to two whole grade differences depending on the mood they're in. So for those of us who think, you know, there's a lot of objectivity in the world, what we're showing is that our emotions are driving much of our judgments. The third is the labeling of emotion. Do we have that sophisticated vocabulary? Do we know the difference, for example, between jealousy and envy? Who's confident that they could define the difference or differentiate jealousy from envy? Raise your hand. Like three people. These are words that we use every day. 
What we know is that envy is more about the object. Mm -hmm. Jealousy is more about the relationship. The, th the third is the comfort in terms of expressing emotion. Are you comfortable expressing yourself when you're in the yellow? Some people don't like being in the yellow. I don't like being in the yellow, for example. I'm, it's not my personality. I'm a green and blue and red kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that is that I try to get in the yellow sometimes. So I went to CrossFit. I went to CrossFit. <laughs> and I decided that, you know, I got to be like a dude. You know, Arturo yesterday called me a dude. I was like, I'm not a dude. I'm an academic. And uh, the, uh, I'm a dude? All right, thanks, Arturo. And uh, so I went to CrossFit. I'm like, you know, running around with these guys. I'm like, yeah, man. And I remember just, like, yeah, man. I'm like, no, I'm going back to yoga. <laughs> it's yoga's for me. I just, I can't do that. Like, you know, I'm not pumped. Try, but it just doesn't work. So we have to know where we are in terms of our comfort level in expressing emotions. And that, ter that comes in terms of speaking, in terms of showing. And then the final skill that we talk about in our work is the regulation of emotion. What are those strategies that we use to help us manage emotions to shift from the red to the green, from the yellow to the green, or from the green to the yellow? Or from my perspective, it's very healthy to be in the red. I like being angry. The anger that I feel uh, drives me to, to try to change educational policy. So you can imagine, and I will end with this, that you have to know your audience in terms of the emotions that you express and how you regulate them. So you go into meet with policymakers in the yellow and you say, good morning, my sunshines. You know, it's not working I, I, based on your reaction. Uh, you can see that that wouldn't work. Coming in the green, maybe for certain audiences, like, can we just take a deep breath? People may roll their eyes. Coming in the blue may not be appropriate either sometimes, right? I mean, Jim, you're, you're the great mission, but like, is there really any hope? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. And then coming in the red may be useful sometimes to get people on the edge of their seats, say, hey, listen, the research is there, people. We know that people who have these skills live better lives. They have better relationships, they have better mental health, they perform better at work. So I'll leave you on that. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And this talk actually uh, fits in nicely. Good job organizing. Um, because I'm going to basically start off where Mark ended and talk about breath, talk about posture, talk about physiological state. Because the whole theme of my talk is that physiological state actually is the mediator of the opportunities to feel compassion. And then if we go back in time and history, we'll find out. Whoop, so the talk can really be summarized in three points. One is embedded in religious and spiritual practices for literally thousands of years are manipulations of vagal pathways. Now that word may sound strange to you, but as we walk through this very brief talk, you understand that uh, in prayer, meditation, and chanting, we are actually recruiting with our behaviors physiological circuits that promote feelings and opportunities to be empathic and compassionate. So manipulations of breath, posture, and vocalizations provide the portals to compassion and health. And I think Mark's point was really good because we can be in certain physiological states and damn it, we're not very inter interactive with other people. And it doesn't matter what you say, we just don't want to hear it. While in others, we'll reach forward, we'll be connected. And finally, manipulations of breath, posture, and vocalizations function and engage and exercise specific vagal pathways. This fits in with the earlier talk about the notion of exercise of compassion and empathy. And these are basically neural circuits. No. So now it's an easy part of the talk, and I don't have to turn around too much. But we can see in these pictures, we see religious practices of people uh, praying and chanting. And we'll look at this, and we can actually see the vocalizations coming out of the mouths, and we're getting certain feelings as we watch this. But we also can look at other forms of religious practice, and we see people are bowing and they're moving. But what I want you to keep thinking about all these is behavioral manipulations that trigger physiological pathways. And we'll start deconstructing that in a moment. And this it was a slide I found online, it's not mine. And this has to do with breath. And the issue is that when we extend the duration of our exhalations, 
we actually increase the vagal effect on our heart. We calm ourselves down. And when we do that, we change our perspective of the world. If you want to do an experiment, and we don't have time today to do that, is I actually, in workshops, have people breathe at different patterns, slow exhalations and rapid inhalations, and then I reverse it to slow inhalations and rapid exhalations, and I have them uh, in couples perceive what each other is seeing or looking at each other. And when they do the long inhalation, short exhalation, which is really the pump in terms of like with athletics, the people think that the other person is extraordinarily evaluative and critical, why don't they like me? But when they do the slow exhalation, they say, well, what an attractive person, I'd like to know that person better. Now within that model, think about what goes on in meditation. Okay, now we're going to basically go into pranayama yoga, because uh, those of you who know me, uh, and there are very few in this room who do know me, uh, I often talk about pranayama yoga as the yoga of the social engagement system, which is defined as the, the striated muscles of the face and head and the vagal regulation of the heart and lungs. And pranayama yoga deals with the facial muscles and also with breath. And what we want to focus on is literally the abdominal region. And then we can look in this picture, which is a cartoon, showing deep abdominal breathing. And then with this picture, we see the person acting it out. And that's because the abdominal, deep abdominal breathing stimulates vagal afferents. And what we'll see is that this is the whole theme of the talk, is that how do you stimulate the vagal system? Now, this is actually uh, uh, caricatures of, uh, actually, anyone know what these movements are? These are orthodox, this orthodox Judaism. And you start seeing the, the posture movements. And it also overlaps with Islam. Islamic movements do similar things. And what they are are really manipulations of baroreceptors, blood pressure regulation. And manipulations of baroreceptors trigger vagal activity as well. So how do manipulation of breath, posture, and vocalization engage in exercise? And this is really what we were just showing you. And do these actually pathways change issues of compassion and, uh, and health? And this is really, when you trigger certain neural systems, they downregulate defensiveness and they upregulate the ability to socially connect and the ability to support health, growth, and restoration. And the theme is that the nervous system of social connectedness is the nervous system of health, growth, and restoration. So, but we also have to understand that the vagus is not just our good guy. It also is a pathway that although it supports uh, social behavior, communication, resilience, and compassion, there are also vagal pathways that are defensive, and they can literally shut you down and kill you. They can be lethal. So this resulted in a decoupling or understanding about the vagal system, and it resulted in the polyvagal theory, which is what I've spent my last 20 years or so working on. And it basically treats the autonomic nervous system not solely as an arousal system, but as a hierarchical reactivity system in which the newer myelinated mammalian vagal components, which are linked with the face and the heart, downregulate sympathetics, downregulate uh, 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 adrenal activity, and downregulate the old vagal response system of defense. So what we really have is now a system that is really evolved for adaptive responses to safe, which is a word that came up early in the discussion, danger, and life threat, which is a shutting down. And the nervous, the practices of prayer, chant, and breath, and uh, with the shifting of posture and the utilization of vocalizations uh, and breath, trigger vagal activity that downregulate the sympathetic nervous system and functionally work to make us feel better. But first of all, we have to understand. Okay, so you see the dotted line, since I can't point at it, I can point like this, right? The dotted line is really our diaphragm, and the organs below the diaphragm actually have a separate branch of the vagus. That branch of the vagus is very important to us because it serves to support our gut. And those of you who, real, uh, who deal with clinical populations, and many people going in for or interested in uh, things like yoga often have gut problems. And it's because their sympathetic nervous system is either downregulating this or the system is acting like a defense system. Thank you. And so you can see this subdiaphragmatic vagus, which is very old and shared with virtually all our, our vertebrate uh, relatives. 
But the superdiaphragmatic above the diaphragm is a myelinate vagus that is linked to the face and also the heart and lungs. And you'll see things like lung and heart, but then we'll see laryngeal and pharyngeal, so vocalizations get involved, and the carotid sinus, which is for blood pressure regulation. So we see that this system is actually a calming system, while this system can either support our visceral homeostasis for health growth, or it could be a defense system. So we have in our vocabulary, I was scared to death, or I was scared, do you know the rest of the word? Okay, so I was shared so much I defecated, okay? We're, uh, so the language, and also remember what your mother told you after swimming, after eating, don't go swimming for an hour. And that was because the sympathetic nervous system actually will inhibit the digestive part, and this system will now act as a defensive reaction. So we can see the social engagement system in the face and the interaction, and this is vagal because it's calming, but we can also see the mouse in the jaws of a cat, and that mouse is, has fainted. And this uh, shutdown is not voluntary, it's not death fainting like the mouse decided to pass out, it's a reflex, and humans have this as well. But the job in life is to recruit this uh, immobilization system of the vagus to move it out of the realm of defense and move it into the realm of being able to be safe in the arms of another. So what we have is a hierarchy in where the super diaphragmatic vagus inhibits the sympathetics and that inhibits the old vagus or unmyelinate vagus. And you can see the mobilization for the sympathetics. But when this system inhibits the so-called stress response or stress axis, it enables the subdiaphragmatic vagus and the sympathetics to be homeostatic. You don't want to turn off the sympathetics. You need them. And what this does is help us work real well. So prayer, meditation, and chants through breath, vocalization, and posture open portals to transform the potentially defensive vagal pathways to support health growth and restoration. And now we can see how they're being used. And here is the take-home summary slides. Vocalizations through vagal mechanisms of laryngeal resp uh, and respiration work. Breathing through, uh, 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 through exhalation basically increases the vagal break on the heart, but abdominal stretch afferents during inhalation trigger the vagal afferents. So it's an exercise, and pranayama yoga is an example of that. And the other point is carotid bowel receptors or blood pressure receptors pick up posture shifts. So these are all embedded in our physiology. And to summarize, embedded in religious and spiritual practices are manipulations of vagal pathways. Manipulations of breath, posture, and vocalizations provide portals to compassion and health and manipulations of breath, posture, and vocalization engage and exercise specific vagal pathways. Thank you. So we're going to have questions uh, from the audience uh, to our panelists uh, regarding what they've talked about, maybe some of your thoughts on uh, what was said. Uh, we have microphones. Feel free to... Uh, go up. So we're going to do this for about 10 minutes, and then uh, we're going to have a break, and then we're going to come back to part two, which is, if you will, uh, compassion technologies applied. Go ahead. Hi, hi there. Is this on? Can you hear me? All right. Um, the great presentation. It was great to hear from all of you. Monica, I was really interested in your talk and how you're spreading the word about this. I thought your top five list it would be so great for companies around the world to hear. So how are you getting that message out? Well, Fred, maybe with your help after today. Uh, I want to address that question by talking a little bit about what all of us in academics know well as the structure of our work. So before we can get the message out, we really need, as social scientists, to believe that the message has a strong foundation and that what we're telling people is rooted in something we can show through the evidence. And the Compassion Lab has been doing research in organizational systems, published our first paper in the year 2000, but it takes quite a bit of time to build a strong research trajectory and enough evidence to feel assured that you're distributing a message that's helpful to people, especially when, as you could see in the compassion story that unfolded, there are so many potential obstacles to the expression of compassion in a complex social system. 
So we're just beginning to understand how to get the message out based on the evidence that has grown over enough time now to feel confident and to have this other wonderful body of research to build on that's really just beginning to, to bloom into its full flower. So I think we're very early. Um, still in the study, there's a lot to understand about compassion itself and especially about how it gets enacted in our complex organizations. And then to be sure that we're distributing the message in a responsible way. So we're in our infancy in getting the message out. Hi, I'm Lydia Khan, and I have a question for Mark, the nice man who led five of us from the parking garage to the venue, so thank you again. Um, it's around language in, in different languages. Have, has your group done any study about the kinds of words people have access in Latin languages, Asian languages, et cetera, other than English? We have. So the, we've worked in other countries doing translations of our work, but also sort of gone to those cultures to see what comes up in general. Um, one of the most interesting, I guess, projects that we worked on was um, working with Inuits from uh, near the North Pole and uh, having seen how few words they have in their language for emotion and then looking at the somewhat some of the repercussions for that. So in this particular group, uh, lots of suicide, depression, uh, alcoholism, and uh, so we're not making any causal claims, of course, about that. But uh, we are. Uh, what we've noticed is that we're to teach them these tools. We have to start from scratch. Literally teach them the concepts of what an emotion is, and then having them use objects and relationships in their lives to to literally come up with the the words for them. So it, it's it's there's there's a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot of complexities. Mark, can I just comment on that though? Because <clears throat> I mean, certainly the implication isn't the nature of their culture is because they have these lack of expression of emotion and their history throughout yes. is one of suicide. I, I mean, that I, I mean, uh, isn't a more accurate statement that their culture has been uh, subversed by Western culture and it has created a set of feelings of which they are not used to and as a result it is manifested in these types of behavior. Yeah. But, but again, they, they, have, they have very little um, vocabulary to express those feelings. So, with the, so that, that suppression and all those strategies that they're not able, the healthy strategies um, have been not taught. A question for Stephen. The way that we currently sit ten, eight hours a day by a computer, do you think that there are effects on our physiology? And would there be implications of your work for? Oh, absolutely. Uh, what we're doing as we sit at the computer is we're actually in a physiological state of withdrawing the myelinate vagus without stimulating the sympathetics usually. And what we end up doing is feeling exhausted without having the mobilization that we normally associate with, with uh, exhaustion. So if we run a lot, we feel exhausted. But sitting at the computer leaning forward is a state of vigilance, uh, but it's not a state of mobilization. And it, it, we evolved to do that for short periods of time, not for long periods of time. First, thank you all. This has been a great, I think, bit of value for all of us. Um, my question is for Mark. I'm right now teaching uh, mindfulness, including social and emotional intelligence, to kindergartners and first graders. Right. Um, what do you recommend is the best way to get them to go from experiencing that emotion to actually m getting to that cognitive moment of knowing what it is and actually choosing to do something about it instead of just continuing with being in their rage or whatever it may be? So one of the things that we've learned a lot using this tool with children is that you know, we're very good at identifying emotions at the extremes. And we're used to calling out emotions when they're at the extremes. So why are you so angry, like enraged, or you know, completely manic or ecstatic? But we don't really talk a lot about emotion when we get closer and closer to the middle. You know, the, uh, the vectors, let's say. So going from let's say, peeve to being irritated, to being annoyed, to angry, to enraged, to irate. Um, and what we've learned is that by teaching children the vocabulary that, this, that really describes the full range of that one emotion, 
Mm -hmm. uh, they start identifying their feelings earlier in the generative process and can regulate more effectively. Because it's harder to regulate when, you're, when you've, you're hijacked. It's much easier to regulate when you are feeling a mild, uh, mild intensity. Thank you. Yeah. The question is for Emma, um, for the whole panel. Thank you. Um, in the beginning of your talk, you say that um, we're all wired for empathy, all wired for compassion. And I'm hoping you can say something more about that claim relative to some of the studies that I've recently seen that as much as 10% of the population um, suffers from some version of psychopathy, not violent, not um, horrific, but the type of psychopathy that prevents you from feeling the emotions of others. And typically we see these people, they're quite successful, they're very highly acquisitive and so on. So I'm hoping you can say something about that. To be honest, I don't know too much about psychopathy, um, except that it's definitely a field of research and for empathy researchers because of um, just looking at the, dif the brain differences. And um, I know of one study that showed that they actually have the ability to recognize emotions. It's just more of how they react to them that's di that may be different. So um, I think it's also still a, a growing field of research, but do any of the other panelists know more than I about this? So it's, I think it's still in development to kind of figure that out. I didn't know about the 10% part. That's definitely worrisome. I think that there's a body of literature that is saying that in some of these uh, professions that are goal-oriented, potentially at the expense of others, it attracts a subset of people who are that standard deviation away from what we would consider within the boundaries of normalcy. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but there's actually a new book out by a neuroscientist who in fact uh, rates very highly on the psychopathy scale and uh, actually has great insights into this and actually acknowledges his lack of empathy and caring for others and he's very goal oriented. But the amazing thing is he has enough insight, I'm not quite gonna say self-awareness, uh, where he, he defines it, acknowledges it and says I see it but I'm doing this to show you on a competitive level that I can't understand this. <laughs> but it's not because he actually cares. And it's actually a fascinating, if you, I can't remember the name of the book, but I'm sure if you, you can find it quite easily. Yes, sir. Um, my question is about vagal manipulation and changing your state. Does it help only get into a calm and peaceful state or can you also get into an ex excited and passionate state and is there a conflict physiologically between? Oh, it, just different strategies. So like when Mark was describing what it was to work out in the gym, I'm always reminded of my youth as a sprinter. And I ran and what people used to do in terms of their breathing patterns to change their physiological state to get it really mobilized so you could jump out of the blocks. So your threshold would be very low and your ability to explode would be right there. So the issue is understanding how these behaviors manipulate physiological state, enable you to kind of match the world <laughs> with your physiological state. And this is very important, especially when you deal with colleagues. And you can see and just watch how they breathe. And if they do short uh, uh, exhalations, you know they're anxious people. And, and they're not really listening to you, so that's, or themselves. <laughs> And if they do long outward breaths and put their arm around you? Uh, well, they may not be listening to you either. <laughs> <laughs> On that, uh, no, go ahead. I, I am completely blown away by the panelists and the questions, and I'm just blinking my eyes saying wow all the time. Um, so my question is, is all these emotional skills, these compassion skills, are these something that have to be taught to kids when they're very young? Is this something that's set in stone? Or how much does it actually change as we grow older? I'm 28, I look at my dad and how he expresses his emotion, how I express my emotion, and how young kids do. So I'm just kind of curious about research that you guys have found. I'll, I'll make a quick comment. The, the whole theme of my talk was that there are literally neural platforms or physiological states that provide portals or platforms upon which more pro-social behavior can occur. And it's only under those states, which are during safe or in safe contexts, that you can then start manipulating it. So the notion of behaviorally training this is really contingent upon the individual being in a safe environment and having a physiological state that's compatible with the expression of that behavior. I'll just add on to that, which is the, 
we feel very strongly that it has to be explicitly taught. Um, that we are not brought into this world knowing about cognitive reappraisal. Uh, you know, we're not brought into the world knowing how to reframe uh, the way someone is presenting to us you know, in a negative way or something like that. We don't know an emotion vocabulary. Um, so for us, it's, it's very explicit, and what we're doing is tracking the developmental trajectories of children to create norms in terms of their emotional development, and then making sure that children are achieving those goals within those, within those milestones. When it, when it comes to empathy, not emotional intelligence, um, the broader construct, babies have a basic capacity for re emotional resonance. So infants, when they're first born, can mimic their mother's faces. And um, they'll, if another baby's crying, they might start to cry as well. So this very rudimentary stage. And there are developmental stages of empathy up until adolescence where cognitive ability starts to increase. Um, that's not my area of expertise. It's just some stuff I've picked up. but. Um, I, I do think there's some natural capacity at, at that level, although I agree that the more cognitive strategies are things we can learn as we go. I, I, it's interesting. There have been, I, I think, three recent books on free will, one by Sam Harris, one by Leonard Malad now, and I think the third by Brian Kazaniga, uh, regarding free will. And we talked about the fact that emotion has a huge impact and actually our functioning and you know the question is, in fact, I think it was even stated that something like 70 to 90 percent of our behaviors are predestined based on our emotions at the time, while we think that we're actually analyzing and logically going through a process. Uh, any comments on that or thoughts? Yeah. Actually, there's always a comment. Um, <laughs> the, the, I think when we use the word emotion, we fall into a trap because emotion is a psychological construct. And it's really utilizing different brain structures from brainstem all the way up to cortex in terms of appraisal. I think we need to move back down and talk about literally physiological state. And it, actually, I um, created, I made a term called neuroception because it was the body's ability, the nervous system's ability to evaluate risk in the environment without awareness. And so this is at a subcognitive sub level, and this is part of what we're picking up, of whether or not we're in safe environments. This is what the baby studies really show us. That it's far from syntax or words. Prosody is powerful. Facial expressivity is powerful, but it's also powerful with our pets. So if you have your dogs and cats, they'll be responsive just like preverbal infants. So it's because the nervous system of mammals is really evolved to be very tuned to other. And that's because mammals had to basically downregulate their defensive strategies to literally live with another or be safe in the arms of another, which, which is what humans do. And if they misread the cues, they're eaten or they're killed. And so the, this sensitivity is, is part of what it is to be genetically a mammal. I can add on to that. Um, I think part of what we need to do is become better self-scientists. And the... You know, the physiological piece, I think, is critical. The cognitive piece is critical. The expressive piece is critical. And when we teach children and adults to be, uh, to make sort of, uh, build that awareness, you know, sometimes I recognize how I'm feeling based on my attention and, and the way I'm expressing emotion. Sometimes I realize my mind is going in one direction. Sometimes I pick it up through the physiology. Each one of those can trick us, though. So um, from our perspective, it's um, really becoming that self-scientist. And the other thing I wanted to mention is the work of Jerry Clore, which really talks about the, that it's not about the necessarily the emotion that's influencing the thinking, it's about the lack of awareness of the emotion. So that when we are unaware of how we are feeling, oftentimes it biases our cognition. But if we check in and say, I'm really angry right now, that that bias on behavior changes. I think that was really one, point. one final <clears throat> comment, and, and that is the afferents of our physiology don't have the specificity as the afferents from our other senses. So the vocabulary of our internal state will never reach the specificity of our sensory other sensory systems. And the second point is that the afferents of our visceral state affect our brain stem, and this uh, basically propagates and changes accessibility to different cortical areas. And this is where that interaction between appraisal, awareness, and everything can be modulated or mediated by visceral state. We have time for one more question. Why don't you go ahead? 
My name is Wadley Weininger, and I'm interested as a clinical psychologist in how to bring what you just talked about, mindfulness, into the situations when we are triggered, when we are upset. And my question is, do we have to see it as different layers? When I think of you, Stephen, that there has to be an ongoing practice of working with posture and breath and chanting, let's say, and then there has to be like a, um, a medium level where we train, educate ourselves uh, into behaving differently, even when we are not triggered terribly. And then what can we do in that moment when we are triggered and how can we come to a more wise, compassionate, mindful response? And what is the research on that? That was a short, simple question. Thank you. <laughs> I'll give it real quick. What you could do is just um, breathe out slowly, which is an accessible system. I really wasn't arguing for training on all this. I was just explaining that this had been done for hundreds of years, and it was very. Some of these methods are actually quite efficient. So exhaling slowly. Another one which people do use to regulate is to sing or to expand the durations of their, of their phrases, which is a form of extending exhalation. So people may be running off at the mouth. Let them run off at the mouth. It's a vagal exercise. Uh, on, uh, on that note, uh, we're going to take a break. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much.